Hello, can everyone hear me in the room? Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Can, you, can everyone hear me in the back? Hi. We're going to get started with the program this evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to start with the greeting everyone should know by now. Assalamu alaikum. I think I got the response somewhere in the back. Assalamu alaikum. We'll try again. There we go. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome, everyone. This is a very, very special evening. I'm very proud to be a part of. My name is Amna Nawaz. I'm the National Correspondent Substitute Anchor at the PBS News Hour. It's uh, a very special time for all of us, for millions of Muslims in America and around the world. I am the daughter of Pakistani immigrants. I grew up here in the States. Ramadan for me was not just about the practice of fasting and introspection, but it was a chance to teach my mostly white, mostly non-Muslim friends and neighbors about this incredible tradition. And that's why I'm so excited for this evening tonight, because it's about our community. It's about not just the communities in which we were raised and the communities that made us who we are. It's about the communities that we create. And that's what we're doing here tonight. We are creating community. Tonight, we are trading political and professional missions for the mission of creating historic night. It's the first ever congressional iftar sponsored by three Muslim <laughs> members of Congress. And I also think it's the first time that the Speaker of the House is going to be addressing a congressional iftar. So a uh, quick round of thank yous to, let's say a quick thanks to our event co-chairs. That is Congressman Andre Carson, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, and Congresswoman Rashida Talib. Special thank you also to everyone who traveled a great distance to be here tonight. Our, your presence means very, very much to us. Quick rundown of what to expect tonight before you start hearing from some of our speakers. Uh, you'll see the dates and things sort of on the tables. They'll be circulating uh, as well, closer to the time to break the fast. 8.18 is the time to remember. That's the time we'll break the fast tonight with the help of Imam Dean uh, W. Sharif, who is here from his masjid in New Jersey tonight. He'll be leading us through the Azan. For anyone who wishes to to pray. There's a prayer room outside of here. It's a little difficult to get to, but if you wish to, you can gather outside, uh, outside the doors, write it after the Azan, and you can be led down there. Um, one more thank you, by the way, to the, uh, it, it's an enormous effort to put something like this together. So let's say a thank you to the dedicated staff of Muslim Advocates and their board who made this event possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce now and welcome up here, as soon as she's done saying her hellos, the Executive Director of Muslim Advocates, that is Farhana Farah. Thank you so much, Amina. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace and good evening. My name is Farhana Kara, and I'm the Executive Director of Muslim Advocates. Muslim Advocates is absolutely thrilled and honored to be co-hosting this historic iftar, the first ever iftar jointly hosted by the Muslim members of Congress and attended by the Speaker of the House. When I co-founded Muslim Advocates, along with the support of many of you in this room, I had just completed my service as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. It was 2005. We started Muslim Advocates because American Muslims needed a seat at the table with expert representation to fight bigotry and discrimination. And we weren't getting it. Today, we are at the table. And so much more. When I walk the halls of Congress, advancing the rights of my community and all Americans, I can now see myself an American Muslim woman for the first time in my elected officials. Whenever I see Congresswoman Umar or Talib, I am filled with enormous, enormous pride. 
We also now, ha now have a Muslim member of Congress who has served for over a decade, Congressman Carson. <laughs> And we have the first ever Muslim statewide elected official, Minnesota's Attorney General, Keith Ellison. <laughs> we can still reach even higher heights. We've never had a Muslim judge, senator, or governor, although he or she might be in the room this evening. And so it is with enormous gratitude that I recognize and thank our co-chairs Representatives Carson, Umar, and Talib. Thank you for your courage, your service, and for showing the American people who we are as American Muslims. In fact, Muslims have been in America since before its founding, when the first slave ships arrived on its shores. It's estimated that up to a third of slaves were brought here from Af West Africa were Muslim. Slave labor was used to build this very building, the US Capitol. So when I think of Ramadan as a time for reflection, a time to honor sacrifice, I think of them. I and everyone here would not be here today without the sacrifice of our African-American Muslim brothers and sisters. So we as Muslims in America have come a long way, but we still have a long way ahead of us to realize a future that treats each of us with respect and dignity. This congressional term, there is historic legislation the No Ban Act, a bill to overturn the Muslim ban for good. Each day for more than two years, the Muslim ban has been ripping apart families and loved ones, denying necessary medical treatment to those in need, and sowing bigotry and division across our country. This Ramadan, I reflect on this horrific policy and what these families are going through. Action on the No Ban Act can't come soon enough. In this Ramadan, I am also thinking of Muslims across the country who are bravely attending mosques, mosques that are being threatened and targeted for violent attacks. Today, all of we have the peace of mind knowing that we have the Capitol Police protecting us. But that's not the case for many Muslim families, like my uncle and his family. They, serve, they pray in small mosques like other American Muslims that are tucked away in every corner of our country. I've been to my uncle's mosque in Arizona, where just after the Christ Church mass attacks, a man entered the building, uninvited. He asked about prayer times and checked the mosque's surveillance cameras. He then followed the imam into his office and made a sawing motion across his neck. Fortunately, he was caught and arrested. But that's just one mosque in one community. In recent years, we've seen an epidemic of attacks and threats to mosques across this country, including just at the beginning of Ramadan with an arson attack and a mosque in Connecticut. You see, it shouldn't require bravery to stand up for religious freedom, but in today's America, it does. So as I reflect on our progress and our struggles, I want to take a moment to express my gratitude. I am so thankful for your support and the support of all of our elected officials who are here tonight. I am thankful for our allies, both here and across the country, who are fighting every day so that our country lives up to its ideals. I'm thankful for your leadership, your tenacity, your willing spirit to take on these challenges together Thank you all so very much for joining us. Enjoy the evening.
Okay, a number of folks we'd love for you to be able to hear from tonight, so we'll keep everything moving right along. Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, if you wouldn't mind addressing us now, you all know or help me in welcoming her right now, the very first Muslim woman to serve in the Michigan House. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Insha'Allah, all my Muslim sisters and brothers are having a wonderful Ramadan, that you're getting closer to Allah, closer to uh, being so much unapologetically yourself uh, in so many ways through your faith. Um, I just want to thank all of my colleagues for being here. There's an incredible African-American pastor uh, in my district, a Baptist pastor, who said, you know, Rashida, this country is not divided. We're just disconnected. And we need to connect uh, on all different levels. Um, but I'm always so um, uh, in reminder of the fact that, you know, when I ran for office, I really wanted to free people from corporate greed and all this. And I'm still going to do it. Um, but I, I remember meeting a young girl who was eight years old. Her name is Rian. She was also Palestinian. Uh, American and she kept going like this you know what I mean rep green like just she kept going like that so that's a mother's cue of like you got to ask her about the blazer so I said oh nice blazer Rian and she said uh-huh I'm trying to look like you <laughs> and and I said well forget Congress you need to run for United States president and she goes uh-huh and at that moment at that moment uh, I just realized this is so much bigger than us, so much bigger than the community that believed in me. Um, and the 13th Congressional District is, is where I grew up, where I was shaped to the person that I am today, the woman that I am today. And I got to tell you, you know, one of the things that the American story that just yet has been told is that Sister Alhan Omar and I got elected by fellow Americans who didn't share our same faith. They didn't share our ethnicity. And that's the part that nobody has been talking about, the fact that at home, a predominantly African-American district made history and elected a first Muslima. That a predominantly white community elected Sister Ilhan Omar. That to me, that to me is something that needs to be uplifted and highlighted every single day when people say we are the first. Yes, we, ran to, we didn't run to be the first of anything, but um, I, I know in my heart, um, you know, we wanted to fight. Uh, we wanted to bring a different lens that hasn't been at the table, and uh, we've had to do it courageously, even under attack. And I want to thank all of the incredible organizations that are in this room for continuing to uplift us, to continue to support us, and to have our back. Um, again, I, I can't tell you, being here sometimes is so surreal. My mother only went up to eighth grade education, my father fourth grade education. Could have never imagined their daughter becoming a United States Congresswoman. And so, inshallah, that inspires yet another generation. And one day, one day, there will be a little Rashida or a little Alhan running for president. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome our next speaker now. She's been a leader for so many communities for so many years. Congresswoman Judy Chu joining us now. She's the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and a lead co-sponsor of the No Ban Act. Join me in welcoming her now. I am so thrilled to be here at this very, very special iftar here on Capitol Hill. And let me start by wishing all of you a very happy and blessed Ramadan. We are a country that was founded on the principle of uh, being able to offer opportunity to everybody regardless of where they're from or who they worship. But that policy is under attack because of white nationalist policies. And that's why we cannot accept hateful policies like the Muslim ban. And though the Supreme Court ruled last year that the Muslim ban was within Trump's executive power, we will not give up in our fight to stop it. And that's why I was so excited in this last spring for the introduction by Senator Chris Coons and I of the No Ban Act. This bill would repeal all three versions of President Trump's Muslim ban and ensure that individuals are not denied entry into the U.S. solely because of their religion and actually establishes criteria for the president to establish any kind of travel ban. It's gaining so much support. 450 groups have endorsed it. The bill has a 123 co-sponsors in the House and 33 co-sponsors in the Senate. 
And I'm also very excited to announce that the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee has already said that they would hold a joint hearing on this bill next month. And I've talked to leadership in the House, and they are supportive of putting this bill on the floor so that we can make a strong statement that such a ban should not be taking place in America. So I am so happy that we, we are making such a huge step forward on that. But what we do know is that our country has been made richer through the experiences and contributions of Muslim Americans and all Americans that come from different backgrounds and religions. And that's why at the start of Ramadan this year, I introduced House Resolution 276 to recognize the history and contributions of American Muslims to our country. In introducing this resolution, I was in awe of all the examples that we found of the positive impact Muslims have had in this country. Muslims have served in the armed forces under our flag of every major U.S. conflict starting from the Revolutionary War. Muslims have represented us at the Olympics, designed skyscrapers that are world famous, and brought home to America Nobel Prizes. And we have trailblazers, stars like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and of course, our first Muslim American female members of Congress, Ilhan Omar Rashida Tlaib. So thank you. I'm so proud to have each and every one of you here in Washington working to make this a better place. And I know that together we will ensure that America lives up to its values and is a land of opportunity for everyone, regardless of where they come from or how they worship. Thank you so much. You know, Congresswoman, mentioning Kareem Abdul-Jabbar reminds me uh, that Ennis Cantor is playing right now in the playoffs while fasting and playing very well, I might add. That's right, yes. <laughs> Oregon's well represented. Um, let's hear from our next speaker now, another one of our co-hosts for tonight's event. Uh, Congressman Carson, if you wouldn't mind joining me up here. Andre Carson, of course, of Indianapolis, co-host here, also Dean of the Muslim Members of Congress. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Have a reem. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Thank you. Ramadan Mubarak. Well, I want to thank uh, my colleagues. If you serve in Congress, in the House or the Senate, please raise your hand. Look at these proud Americans. Look at these. Look at our colleagues, our supporters who love Muslims. That Senator Durbin. Look at the. All the rock stars are here. Goodness. <coughs> Speaker Pelosi is on her way. You know, um, I'm pleased to stand alongside uh, two great and powerful women, uh, Sister Ilhan and Sister Rashida. Uh, when I first came to Congress, um, I had a little big brother in Keith Ellison. And it was comforting to know that uh, Keith and I fought similar battles. And it was interesting, uh, those of you who grew up with siblings, constantly being compared to Keith because Keith was such a larger-than-life figure. People would always say, well, Keith is doing this. Why don't you do that? Keith is doing this. You should be doing that. And I said, wait a minute. I'm from Indiana. <laughs> Keith can run down the street naked and get reelected. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but we're proud of uh, the boldness. You know, when, when, when uh, the elections were taking place last year, I was nervous because Keith was moving on to become Attorney General. And I was saying, I hope that these folks win because I don't want to be the only one in Congress. <laughs> and then I looked up and I saw these two amazing sisters who have been friends, they've been bold, they've been willing to listen to their constituents, and they're willing to speak out and fight the good fight. You know, when you first come to Congress, um, I don't care what you do and what you say. If you're a Muslim, it's going to get exaggerated. Uh, the, 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 the flames will burn even higher and stronger. 
but to have congressional colleagues support us. And they have Muslim constituencies, Dr. Green. It feels good to have allies. There are honorary Muslims who serve in Congress who help us in the House and the Senate, and we're trying to get one over. They said that, Sister Yvette, that there are three in Congress, but there are really three plus AOC. <laughs> AOC is right here with taking shahada. I'm going to get her in a few minutes. Just repeat after us. You know, she's almost there. But, you know, we're dealing with issues like the Muslim ban, and the Israeli-Palestinian question is constantly persistent in our dialogue. We're concerned about our brothers and sisters in Yemen. We're concerned about our brothers and sisters in Africa and Europe, the Middle East. But let us not forget, and we'll never forget, the reason why we're here. And that's to serve our constituents who are concerned about infrastructure. They're concerned about education, Senator Durbin. Uh, they're concerned about preserving our republic and upholding our Constitution. And we will continue to do that. As I've said before, it's not enough now to have three. I'm seeing 2020, five more coming to Congress. And that's okay. That's what America represents. For some of the most well-educated folks in this country, they happen to be Muslims. Go to any major courthouse, you'll find a Muslim attorney or a judge. Go to any major hospital, you'll find a Muslim physician. We represent all that is great about America. So thank you. What's on the menu? I hope we don't have Burger King and McDonald's. So we're gonna, <laughs> are we going to be like the White House or are we going to have some good cuisine? Because I'm hungry. Jazakallah care. thank you so much. It's three plus ALC. You'll hear from her. I've been told the food is very good. Don't worry. And uh, the hour is approaching very, very soon. I I'd love to invite someone who's here to make community, to be part of our community tonight. That is Senator Dick Durbin. If you'd like to deliver some messages, we'd love to hear from you, Senator. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming right now Senator Dick Durbin. Thank you very much. as -salamu alaykum. It is an honor to break fast in the United States Capitol with our Muslim American colleagues in Congress. I want to thank Muslim advocates for including me in this historic moment. I also want to thank Muslim advocates and the Muslim community for their interfaith activism on so many, many human rights issues. Muslims, like Americans of all major religions, play an important part in American life every single day as teachers, doctors, police officers, soldiers, business owners, artists, parents, engineers, the list goes on and on and on. I'm fortunate that one of my top staffers, the woman who helps to manage the floor of the United States Senate, is a Muslim American woman, Rima Dodeen. Yes. Rima is here this evening. If there is a Muslim American who does not know Rima, I've not met that person. <laughs> they all know Rima, so thank you, Rima, for being here. And I'm particularly honored to be here as well with a man I've come to respect so much for the moment when he spoke out with his wife to America. As the father, a gold star father and mother, a Muslim American spoke at a national convention and put a face on the real contributions, the life and death contributions being made by the Muslim American community. Can we give a round of applause to Mr. Kazir Khan? Thank you for being here. It was February 2017 and the travel ban had been announced and the Muslim American community in the Chicagoland area, which Congressman Schakowsky knows so well, asked if they could meet with me at a mosque in Villa Park. It was a Sunday afternoon and it was cold, which is not unusual in Chicago. And I went there and surprised to see a sea of cars parked around this mosque. And I watched as people were walking blocks to get inside the mosque for this town meeting after the travel ban. And as I went in, I was amazed at the size of the crowd. People were standing four and five deep against the wall and I tried to shake as many hands as I could walking up to the front of this meeting. And then I saw him. I saw this little boy, and he was in a Cub Scout uniform. And I stopped, because I remembered a speech, a speech I had heard many, many years before on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. It was a speech by Norm Mineta, a congressman from California. 
And he told of the day when his father said to him, Norm, tomorrow we have to catch a train. We're leaving our home here in San Jose, and I want you to wear your Cub Scout uniform. And so he put on his Cub Scout uniform and didn't know where he was headed. But he got on that train, and he was headed for a Japanese internment camp where he and his family waited out the Second World War. I thought about that little boy and what he must be hearing for the first time in his life now, words that we don't want any American to hear, not a Japanese American during World War II, not a Muslim American today. And I said to him and to the other young people who were there, take heart, because we are here today together and know some very basic things. First, you are a part of a religion that is dedicated to peace around the world. Second, that religion will give you values and inspiration. Next, your family is so important to you and always will be in your future. And know that millions of Americans are by your side, even in the darkest moments. And remember that someday, someday, you may be called on to stand up for people who are treated with hate and scorn in this great nation. I left that meeting feeling sadness in my heart that any children would have to go through that travel ban and the impact it might have had on their lives. And now I come with this gathering this evening with the dedication we all share to make certain that anyone who speaks out against an American for their religion be called out for it, that we stop this white supremacist, white nationalist rhetoric so hateful, so divisive, so deadly as we've seen in Charlottesville and so many other places and that we stand together as Americans, proud of our heritage and committed to those values which brought this nation together. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Senator, those lovely words. We are indeed creating community here tonight. As you said, we are here together today. Someone else who's just joined the room, Majority Leader Senny Hoyer, if you wouldn't mind making your way up. We would love to hear from you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a number of speakers. Of course, we want to try to get everyone to be able to come up and share their remarks and their love. Please join me in welcoming Steny Hoyer to the stage. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You know, on the House floor, we sometimes simply say, I adopt the remarks of the previous speaker. <laughs> Last week, we passed uh, the Equality Act, and I gave a speech on the floor uh, about Martin Luther King's admonition to us uh, that we need to judge one another not by arbitrary distinctions, but on the way we were treated by others and the way others treated uh, others. He called it content of character. Not an arbitrary distinction of color of skin or of religion or gender or who we love. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell me to love my uh, neighbor if they're Christian or if they're straight uh, or if they're uh, this, that, or the other. The Bible tells me to love my neighbor, whoever my neighbor may be. And King added to that, the judgment you make is on how they treat others. Content of character. Uh, we have gone through a rough patch in this country. I know this is not a partisan meeting, but it should not uh, miss any of us that the rise of white nationalism and the sense that it's okay to be hateful to others was demonstrated during the 2016 campaign where it was okay to hit people if they didn't agree with you and by the way I'll pay your legal costs what message do you think that sent in a country that says we hold these truths to be self-evident. And I sit on the floor and I say this all the time, those truths may be self-evident, but they are not self-executing. 
it is up to us to ensure that those promises of equality in the eyes of God, because it was uh, rights given to us by God, not by the Constitution, not by uh, unalienable rights, endowed by our Creator, Some of us must say, well, you look a little different than I look. <laughs> Why does God not think that's the case? Because God looks inside. And as Bill Clinton loved to say, we are 99.7% exactly the same. <laughs> and we ought to treat one another that way. And it's so important that all of you are here. We have the most diverse caucus in the history of our country. And that is a strength, not a weakness. But it will be a weakness if we do not treat one another equally, fairly, justly because it will eat at the fabric of our unity. And that is the thing that will defeat America. The undermining of the sense of we are one nation under God, indivisible. So we're here in this room different colors, different races, different genders, uh, things that we can't see, what are the differences between us, but they exist, to say to one another that we are, as we pledge allegiance to the flag, one nation under God, indivisible, <clears throat> with liberty and all that that connotes and justice in all that that means for all. The famous statement that uh, they came uh, for the Jews, and I was not a Jew and I did nothing. Uh, they came for the homosexuals, as they would call them then, and I was not a homosexual and I did nothing. They came for the Catholics and I was not a Catholic. They came for me, and there was nobody left to help me. We need to be concerned for our country, because our country has been a beacon for peoples all over the world to repair to a country where they saw opportunity and justice. And we need to make sure all of us, all of us have a personal responsibility. I, I give a personal responsibility speech. It's a very short speech. I'll give it to you. If it is to be, it is up to me, each of us, to ensure that our country promise, as Martin Luther King said, is also our reality. Andre. Alon, Rashida, thank you for convening us here. Because while it may be your issue today, it may be another issue tomorrow. And if we don't stand together, we will fall apart. God bless all of you. All right, we mentioned we are making history just by being here tonight. Uh, our next speaker has also made history a couple of times over. Uh, next to Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, she was one of the first Muslim women uh, elected to Congress. She's also lead co-sponsor of the No Ban Act. She was responsible also for the House rule change that allowed her to wear her religious headwear on the House floor. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me now in welcoming Congresswoman Ilhan Omar.
I keep making history. Maybe I should just change my name to history. I said. <laughs> uh, thank you all for laughing at that. Um, <laughs> Andre earlier said, everything we say gets scrutinized, um, and everybody also always loses their sense of humor every time we make a joke. Um, and I am mortified of Andre Carson's joke um, about Alex uh, and how that's going to show up on Fox News. <laughs> Um, and so everybody who will be praying, their makri, please pray extra hard, um, because we do want um, our, our sister Alexandria to come back. <laughs> okay, all right, all, all jokes aside, this is truly a historic night. Um, it is uh, wonderful to be here as one of the first three um, Muslims to serve together in one of the greatest, uh, most powerful bodies in the world, to get this opportunity to convene with you all um, to celebrate um, and to share uh, a tradition of Ramadan that is about truly advancing one another's um, progress. For us, Ramadan isn't just about withholding yourself from food or water, but it's about developing a deeper understanding of the kind of struggles others go through when they are without. Um, it's about connecting beyond a conversation. It's about having deeper empathy. Um, and. And as many of us um, who have had the opportunity to grow up in Muslim majority spaces know, Ramadan is the time of year where everything shuts down, where you get the opportunity to sort of indulge in foods that you never really had, um, but to be conscious of the fact that you need to share that food um, and to make sure that your prosperity doesn't only stay with you, that that prosperity is shared with everyone. Uh, and that really is, I think, what this country is about, that we don't only work to get prosperity for ourselves, but we work to advance prosperity for every single person. Um, we don't just fight so that we have an equal seat at the table, but we fight for every single person to have an equal seat at the table. You don't just fight for your civil liberties or your civil rights or your own equality, but you fight for everyone else's. And the word neighbor truly means to be a neighbor. As Muslims, we are required, we are required not to go to sleep at night with a full belly unless you are sure that your neighbor is going to bed with the full belly. And so that, that requirement as Muslims is one that I take to heart. As I work to further equality and prosperity for all of us, I love this country, I think, more than anyone else could probably love this country. It's given me a second chance, a second opportunity at a life that my family probably gave up on for those four years we lived in that refugee camp. My dad could not have fathomed that he would one day bring his 12-year-old to this country mortified of what laid ahead the possibility of struggling through school, raising his only youngest daughter by himself. Does anybody in this room understand? It is not easy to raise a teenage daughter, and I was not easy to raise. <laughs> I worried what happened when my older siblings left, how he was going to assure that not only did I get an education, but that I was able to sustain 
I was able to sustain my identity, my culture, my proudness. I don't think that all of the things he worried about, all of the things he'd hoped for, that he would ever imagine that 23 years later he would arrive back at, um, at an airport here in DC to see his daughter get sworn in into Congress. That only happens in this country. And I remember right after I'd won my primary, I was talking to Leader Pelosi at the time, Speaker Pelosi now, and she said, what's the one thing you are worried about? I don't think you have a challenge in the general. And I said, well, there's this little problem. I know in this country we have religious liberty. Not everyone understands that. Ignorance is very pervasive in this country. I am worried, I am worried that when I show up in November as the victor of that election, that they will do everything to make sure that I will not be able to wear my headscarf to represent my constituents. And she said, oh, that is the one thing you should never worry about because in here you're going to have soldiers who are going to fight that you have your right to serve your constituents and the people of this country. And so I know that every single time as Muslims we feel threatened, we are worried about our civil liberties being taken away, that people show up and help make sure that we feel reaffirmed that in this country we are as equal as everyone else, that our religious liberties are extended to us. And I know, I know that all of you in this room are committed to that, and I'm really excited to be in community with you to not only fight for you, but to make sure that we are fighting for your future children and their children in creating the kind of America that we all deserve. Now, I will end with one last joke. <laughs> I remember watching Mr. Khan give his speech, and I remember the occupant of the White House mocking his wife and saying, I don't know if Muslim women are allowed to speak. Little do they know they were going to get the two loudest <laughs> Muslim women. <laughs> in the country, in Congress with the biggest mic. So as you enjoy your dates and your iftar, please rejoice in knowing that they are mortified of the fact that they had awakened these Muslim women to fight for their space here in Congress. Thank you. Hi, Congresswoman. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like we've heard her name so much tonight. We would love to invite you up to be able to say whatever it is you'd like to say. Please join me in welcoming right now Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Of course. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, Ilhan, you don't have to worry about, about that. It's a, it's a total honor. It's funny. I go back home and uh, my my deputy my deputy district director she is a uh, hijabi and uh, sometimes we go to Jama we go check in at the mosque we say hello and uh, she kind of ties my hijab for me when I go in and um, and I joke it's like you know when a football coach ties their 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 athletes tie for them or when a father teaches their their son how to tie a tie that's how. Uh, Noreen is trying to teach me how to tie a hijab and it gets loose and it gets messy and my bangs get matted in front of my face but um, but we go in anyway because there is no reason to fear fellowship 
there never will be a reason to fear fellowship. We never have feared fellowship. We never will fear, fear fellowship uh, because I believe that at our core and, and really so much of what we're celebrating is that I know that when Ilham prays, when I pray, when Rashida prays, when Ayana prays, when Jan Schakowsky prays, I believe that those prayers all go to the same place up and um, and I think that that fellowship and that strength and that that lack of fear of fellowship is exactly what the opposition does fear that and any time Rashida or Ilhan speak they're scared too <laughs> myself included uh, and you know it is great that they got more than they bargained for and I think that it's important that, that we bring that advocacy because it is not enough just to be, it's not, just in, it's not enough just for us to have these seats as, as the first hijabi woman, as the first Palestinian woman, as the youngest woman, as this, that, and the other. Um, but it is, it is that we have to voice the needs and voice the perspectives of, of those communities and to voice a different way of governance. Right now, there's an effort, you know, the, the effort and the way that they try to oppose all progress in this country is by pitting communities against one another that have never and have no business being pitted against one another. And um, they did this just last Friday with the Equality Act. Um, it was almost amusing because here we had the Republican Party that is almost entirely male, over a 200 person plus party. Um, only have they only been able to elect 13 women out of over 200 members, 200 odd members, around you know give or take depending on the minority or majority position, and um, and they had the audacity to have one of their male members come up and try to amend it and say advancing queer rights will hurt the women's rights movement, and we're all sitting here the Democratic caucus. 60% queer women, people of color, immigrant, like, how are you going to tell us what's good for us? And this is just the template. They try to import that division. Women against our LGBT community, Jew against Muslim, immigrant versus citizen, in order to make sure that none of us get our interests or our rights advanced. And we will not stand for it any more. We will not stand for it anymore. Because we know that these divisions are a distraction and they are rooted in the subjugation of all the communities involved that are being pitted against one another. And I'm so thankful to be invited here today in fellowship. Thank you, Rashida, Andre, Ilhan, for, for inviting me here today. I'm the last to get between an empty belly, a long day, and iftar. So, um, but I, I, you know, breaking bread is what makes this, this whole moment sacred and special. It's the, be, it's the ability to connect with, with our neighbor and with our brother and with our sister and our, our cousins. Um, over, you know, to, 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 it makes that moment sacred. This moment that we have if we're lucky, if we're blessed three times a day, every day, Ramadan forces us to slow down and acknowledge how holy and beautiful that is. And I'm just thankful to be a part of that. And thank you all again so, so very much. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you also. I'm looking around the room. I'm seeing so many members of Congress who have taken time out of their busy days, and I know y'all are busy. I know there's a lot going on right now, and it means so much to us for you to be here with your Muslim brothers and sisters, to be in community with us. Um, Ramadan is about community. Uh, you've also probably by now familiarized yourself with some of the traditions. We wanted to be able to share a little bit more information, though, for those of you who may not be as familiar. So I'd like to invite up now uh, Camila Rashad. Um, this is going to this. Thank you very much. Come on up. Look, Camila is someone you all should know. She's the founder and president of the Muslim Wellness Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting healing and emotional well-being in the American Muslim community. And don't we need it all? Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Please join me in welcoming her now. Assalamu alaikum. 
Um, dear friends and members of Congress, it's an absolute joy and honor to be present with you on this 15th day of Ramadan. And for all of the fasting Muslims, we become very diligent and you know, very deliberate about how we mark time during this month. It kind of transforms what we think we can accomplish in 24 hours. Um, and we often talk about the enormous challenges we face abstaining from food and water. And every fasting Muslim has been asked this question, and you all know it, not even, even water. water. <laughs> That's right. But as, as someone who's been doing a baby fast since I was about seven or eight years old, I've learned now that there's so much more to be gained during this very deeply personal act of worship. No one knows. These are the obligations that we are invested in. No one knows whether or not you're fasting. This is something that you keep with yourself as a reminder. And we've been taught as Muslims that the prophet, may peace and blessings of God be upon him, said, whoever does not give up false speech, lying, slander, and evil actions, Allah is not in need of him giving up his food and drink, <laughs> right? And so when you find Muslims during this month, the mercy that we have been given during this act is that we are incredibly reflective. It is a time of introspection, of gratitude, of patience, humility, and radical acceptance. It allows us to gain mental clarity, emotional mastery, and self-discipline. And how is this even possible in a time where we're constantly flooded by negative messages about who we are? How are we able to accomplish that level of reflection when we are being told that the country that we have worked so hard to build doesn't belong to us? And so when that question comes, what I want to share with you about Ramadan is that it is a time of incredible joy born of deep gratitude that we don't take anything that we have for granted, that we want our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones to be able to enjoy all of the benefit and the bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that God has given us. And for me, as a descendant of enslaved Africans in this country, it is a time to reflect on all of the things that I have now been afforded as the fourth great-granddaughter, the fifth great-granddaughter, of someone who's only identified in slaveholding papers as Clarissa an African, that her fifth great-granddaughter can stand here in the Capitol building, that she can enjoy her religion, her faith, her identity, all of the things that she holds dear, and she can do it in a joyful way, that she can laugh, that she can count her blessings, right? that she can see another woman who looks like her, who is fearless. Right? These are the things that we are joyful and grateful for, and we don't want to forget it. So when you're with Muslims during this incredibly reflective time, this is when you ask them for the truth, because they're not going to lie. They're like, look, I need to save all of my fasting blessings, so I'm going to have to give it to you straight. So I want us to all think about the ways that we can bring in joy. We talk about the accomplishments of American Muslims. We talk about all of the things that we have been able to contribute in this country. And one of the things that I really want you to remember is that when you're in the company of Muslims, there is incredible hospitality, there is joy, there is celebration, there is love. And this is also what we bring to the American fabric. Lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that yesterday, May 19th, marked what would have been the 94th birthday of El Haj Malik Al Shabazz, right? our beloved brother and hero Malcolm X. For so many of us, the story of his courageous life forever changed ours. So as we reflect on the significance of this gathering, the joy that fills our hearts when we are together, and the boundless potential and resilience of the American Muslim community, I leave you with this simple prayer from Brother Malcolm's iconic autobiography. One day, May we all meet together in the light of understanding. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Sister Camila, for that. Okay, we are very close to the hour. I would love to invite up Imam Dean Sharif. He will be leading us through this final minute here and then through the Azan. If you wouldn't mind coming up. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming him now. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> Peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. Ramadan Mubarak. 
with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. We give all praise and thanks to Almighty God. We witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Almighty God. He is one alone without partners or associates. And we witness that this one God sends messengers to humanity to give human beings guidance. Those messengers include Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. May prayers and peace be upon all of God's messengers and prophets. Gives me a pleasure, and I was told that I have one minute between now and when we have to break the fast, and I do not want to get between any hungry Muslims, that's for sure. <laughs> so I just want to make one little comment, though, that I think is really important to make, that what we're about to do in terms of what you see Muslims praying, and that is we about to turn to a house called the Kaaba, and Sister Talib, Rashida, you made a very significant point, that we're not divided, we're disconnected. The word Kaaba means connection. And five times a day, we are instructed by Almighty God to turn to this house, which means a connection. But it's not just a connection for Muslims. It means a connection for the family of humanity, because this house is a representative of the soul that Almighty God, when he created the human being, he created one soul. He didn't create a soul that is Jewish. He didn't create a soul that is Christian. He didn't create a soul and just made it Muslim. He created a soul that is human. And the one common denominator that we all have is that we have this one human soul. And five times a day, we are asked to turn to this house to remind us about the fact that we're all connected through that one human soul. May Almighty God bless us to bring the family back together again. And we're counting on you, our representatives, to bring us back together again. May Almighty God continue to bless all of you, because I know your job is not easy. Like my job is not easy as an imam. Any religious leader's job is not easy. Holding people together is, is the most difficult task, particularly when their influence is to bring us apart. So our prayers are with you. Believe me, our prayers are with you. And we ask Almighty God to continue to bless you, to stay strong. Believe me that there is no power greater than the human being who bends down, prays down, and exercises the power of prayer. There is no power greater than that. And when we exercise that power, there is no power that is going to come against that that will be successful against that. So with that. I'm going to call, oh, one more point, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is two, two, 2019, 1619 was the date that is recorded where the first slave ship came into this country with African slaves. We are celebrating in this year 400 years of struggle for those ancestors of those slaves that came to America, and we're going to continue the struggle, inshallah. So with that. I'm going to offer the adhan, and I'm going to offer the adhan with the spirit, hopefully, of Bilal. Bilal was Muhammad the Prophet, sallam, his first mu'edhan. And he was enslaved and struggled out of that slavery to become the companion of Muhammad the Prophet and his first caller to prayer. So I hope that you will feel the spirit and hear the spirit of Bilal. I don't have a musical voice. I am, I am not any one of the singers, so I'm just going to give it the best that I can, inshallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا على الصلاة هيا على الصلاة هيا على الفلاح هيا على الفلاح 
Allah.